Okay, again, my name is Joey Quintero, and I work for the Gratis Group. Essentially what we are is we are a manufacturing company that uh, makes photo, video, and audio equipment from everyone to the emerging uh, artist to the budding professional. And uh, essentially what we do is I at first started doing a lot of the engineering and the um, kind of the design behind the products, and now I'm getting more into the marketing end of it, which I've always wanted to do. So I tend to be more of a people person, and I like teaching, and uh, one of my first jobs out of college was teaching high school, which I really enjoyed, but it wasn't quite for me, because I felt myself as always an artist. And uh, like yourselves, I started investing a lot of time into my, my artistic ventures and visions that I was trying to endure, and uh, at some point, ended up in New York City and uh, worked for a lot of different photographers around and about, and uh, eventually got a job with B&H, worked sales for a little bit, and then went into the manufacturing end of, of uh, photography. Sure. And so that's what I do now, and I love it. It's a tons of fun. It's, uh, it's hard work. It, um, I'm always burning the candle, and more importantly, I enjoy talking to people like you guys because it gives me a sense of what we need to do as manufacturers to design different photo, video, and audio equipment that are going to best be suited for you guys, okay? Mm -hmm. So because I was a former teacher, there will be several quizzes in this class, <laughs> okay? And good behavior is important. But beyond that, all I'm going to ask is you to come up here in front of the class, give me the correct answer, and I have seven 32-inch silver white reflectors to give out for you guys, a $25 value, okay? And if you're really good, I do have one of these monolights that I can give away as well. Okay, so ooh, we like that. But only if you guys are good and only if the questions are, are, are well articulated and more importantly that the answers are, are you give me the coverage that I'm looking for. And I might quiz, I might add a, a question of, on a question, on a question as we're doing the quiz, okay? And they'll come up sporadically and that's all. Okay guys, so let's get started. First of all, let's see what we're going to cover today. Uh, essentially what we want to do is this is an intro class and basically we're going to be covering ratios, ratios of lighting, what different light modifiers do, why would you use them. I'm going to give you my personal opinion. Now every bullet that you see up here, okay, all the studio tools, essentially what we're going to do is I'm going to show you an image, I'm going to show you a schematic, I'm going to show you, and uh, more importantly I'm going to show you how I shot the image and why it was done that way. Uh, I'll be quite honest with you, there's no black magic to good photography. It's just a matter of just ironing out like everything, like a good sport. You got to practice, 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 and you got to involve yourself into it, okay? Um, and I'm going to be very honest with you on how I got some of my images, and you'll realize that, gosh, if he can do it, I can do it. Uh, beyond that, under here, everything below, we have a model that's coming in, and we're going to do a live shoot together. And this is why I'm kind of pleased that we have a smaller group today because it makes it a little more intimate as a group to work together and to see what we're shooting. We're going to shoot live into my laptop using the 5D Mark II, using the Canon software, and I'll have somebody man the, the laptop so we can all look at it together and essentially look at the images and see how they come up, okay? Um, but first, we need to cover ratios of light, okay? I really, really try to jam this down your guys' throat for a couple reasons. They concern the big threes. Now the big threes I realized when I first got into photography, which is back in the eighth grade-ish, I noticed my aunt would carry a rolly and she would look down in this rolly and take a meter reading on whatever she was doing. And I love the fact that it was a very creative uh, way of expressing herself, but more importantly it was a very technical way of applying that creative feeling that we all get. And we've all been there at some place in our, some place and point where we're looking, we're like, ah, I love that shot, I'm gonna get that shot, that's the shot got to do it. Or you're dreaming in your bed and you're like, I know I'm gonna, how I'm going to portray that storyline. The way you're going to do it, quite honestly, is you're going to get it by understanding your aperture, your shutter speed, and your ISO. Because what you have to do is you have to take a two-dimensional plane and make it look three-dimensional. And we're going to do that with light. Beyond that, what you have to do is take what you see here, what you're thinking up here, and what you feel here more, more importantly, and then apply it to this digital machine that you got in hand. And you're going to do that with your aperture, your shutter speed, and your ISO. And we're going to go over that extensively. And they may, might be a quiz on that as well, all right? OK, let's get into the ratios. Now, the first thing I want to, want to include as far as ratios go is you need to start thinking in f-stops. You need to understand that light is thinking in f-stops. You need to correspond the light on me that you see here and the light outdoors and understand that, yes, there is a ratio difference between the light qualities of them. We're not talking about hard light. We're talking about soft light. We're talking about the amount of light knowing that to expose a 
aperture and exposing an f16 aperture are two different monsters of light. They're two different amounts of light. Understand that, accept it, okay? So from now on, we're going to be talking in f-stops in this class for the most part, okay? And if you don't get it, just stop me and we'll go on and we'll proceed forward. We'll do our best to explain it, okay? Ratios, guys. Okay, I'm going to be really brief on this because we want to get going, we want to move, and we really want to get to our demo portion of this uh, class. Now, first and foremost, if you had two lights on Joey right here, each set at the very same power, very flat light, you'd have the equivalent of a mug shot. Am I right? Okay. Now, beyond that, if you have a light on Joey and you have the, another light in your background and it's the very same f-stop, Joey shot at f8 with a light set at f8, a light set at f8 on the background, you have a one-to-one -one ratio. That means both of your lights share the same output. Simple. Okay. Now beyond that, we've got slide film or a two to one ratio. A typical two to one ratio is very much like a high key kind of shot. We've all seen bouncing babies in front of a white background. Try to hold it in, guys. Um, very popular when you shoot mothers, puppies and kittens and children because it's very airy and it's one first and foremost very non-distracting type of image. Um, I have an image that will support that and then basically a high key type of shot, okay? Three to one is very, your typical black and white shot. If you don't know a good typical black and white shot, I suggest you start studying the zone system from Ansel Adams. Very important to understand the different whites, whites, all the way to the black, blacks, and every gradation of gray in between. Very important if you want a lot of depth within your images. And again, if you're not sure about the zone system, Ansel Adams is the man, okay? Four to one is when you get some shadowing and contouring. That's when you end up with a little more hard light on your subject, maybe some scraping across. You can see the way this light is hitting me right now. It's kind of scraping across my face. Maybe my nose is elongated, a hard chin, stronger cheekbones, as opposed to me doing this, okay? Contouring, the ratio between the light right here and underneath my chin is huge, okay? Eight to one is dramatic low key, and I say this, and I'm gonna beat you up with this if you haven't seen it. A good, good example of low key lighting is to understand film noir type of lighting. That is, is understanding the lights and darks in films. Orson Welles' Touch of Evil is a fine example of excellent dramatic low key lighting. Essentially what you're doing is you're watching a movie that is almost in the dark, and you're captivated by the scenery in it, which is a null and void, but just hearing the sounds, the subtle nuances of different light qualities, you're going to love it. It's fascinating. You're going to realize, I'm looking at nothing but things that are way overexposed and things that are way underexposed. But a great way to tell a story in given doses, of course. Okay? We have any questions? Yay. Okay, let's move on. Your typical high key type of shot or a one to two ratio lighting. Now the way we shot this is quite simple. It's just a one light deal with a reflector on the other side. Obviously the, the image was composed together, we composited. There's four different shots, we threw them together, not a big deal. This was done for a catalog some, whew, maybe about four or five years ago now. Make a long story short, it's just one softbox, very easily done. You can see the light scraping across her face. But more importantly, there's another light source that's hitting the background. Now, if she is exposed at F11, what is our background if it's one stop over or twice the light? Come on, guys. F16, exactly. Twice the light is one stop. You got to understand that. It should be clicking at this point, okay? We're thinking in F-stops now. The shutter speed is 1 over 125. That's usually good enough for the studio and people for the most part, okay? Again, very simple. Boom. Now, if you look at something beyond this, we have a little bit of contouring in the face. You can see how the light quality is scraping across her, and we have a different shadowing effect as opposed to this side, right? That's also a good one to two ratio lighting, okay? How do you achieve that? You just put the light on one side, and you just meter one side of the face to another, you're done. But what it, essentially what we're trying to achieve here is a little bit of depth, right? Okay? Two-dimensional plane, it's our job to make it three-dimensional, okay? Now, I kind of wanted to cover this. Those who just don't know shallow depth of field and, and huge depth of field, basically, a shallow depth of field, you're going to think 2.8, 4.0, 4.0, 4.0, 4.0, 4.0, 4.0, 4.0, 4.0, 4.0, 4.0, 4.0, 4.0, 4.0, 4.0, 
okay? Joey likes to shoot primarily like an F11, F16, because most of my jobs are an assignment, and I have, usually have to give it to another team of retouchers who I don't know, and they're usually clients, and they have their team of retouchers, so I have to make sure that my stuff primarily is super, super sharp. I like to shoot at F F11, F16, and if I can, beyond that, depending on the power. 2.8, you recognize this. A lot of people are into fast lenses or whatnot, very shallow depth of field. This portion is tack sharp, and you get that nice fuzzy pastel background, which is very popular. Uh, portraits are tough that way. One of my very first lenses was a 51.0. 51.0. I don't know if you remember that thing. It was a piece of glass about this big, um, weighed about 125 pounds. <laughs> And what was nice about it, though, is you got a shallow depth of field that was much more fuzzier in this monster right here. The downside is to it, you take a deep breath, and everything's out of focus. So you're doing everything on a tripod. And I realized, maybe that's not the best thing for me, because I haven't taken a sharp image since I bought this lens. You know, so uh, years later, sold the lens and got something else. But it was, it's a very boutique lens. And I know they stopped making it some time back. Um, but 1.0 got me in trouble. It just wasn't for me. And that, again, that's just Joey. Now, if you're thinking maximum depth of field, think of F11 all the way to 64 or 90 if you're a big guy and shooting with a 4x5 or an 8x10. Um, think of this. I had to include the Grand Canyon. One, I'm from Arizona. Two, look at this. From the edge of this cliff all the way to the end, these clouds are tack sharp. This tells me it was a very long exposure. It's sunny Arizona, so the guy could get away with just sitting there for two. I'm guessing if he shot it at F64, what would you guess? He sat there for maybe a second. You know, and you can do that at F64. This buys you depth of field, OK? And this is why Joey likes to shoot at F11, because it buys me depth of field. I'm never going to shoot the Grand Canyon. I've been to the Grand Canyon about 15 times, and I never once took a camera. And I'm still ashamed of myself. I don't know why. I, just, I was just too, too enamored of getting down the mountain with a horse, which was a lot of fun. If you can do, please. OK, typical 1 to 3 ratio lighting is, again, I'm trying to emphasize the whites of her eyes to the darkness of that mascara. OK, very simple. Just understand the palette. A typical 1 to 3 ratio lighting is understanding the palette between all the lights, lights, and the darkest darks, and all the grays in between. OK, it's got a full palette of all the darks, darks, light, lights, and all the gray, grays. Okay, so something that you think, when you start processing black and white charts, start thinking of the zone system from Ansel Adams again. Fine example there. If you don't know who he is, I'm appalled. Okay. <laughs> now, typical one to four ratio lighting. Now, this was kind of a fun shot. It was a beauty shot that we did for a modeling agency some years back. And kind of didn't know what to do because the girl was young. She was semi-experienced, but not great. And what we did is, all I did was put a light right above her, right here. And you can see where it's scraping across her face. And we just had her move in two inch increments like this in front of the camera. We just pop, 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 pop. What was nice about it is, as a happy accident, is some of the light was spilling onto the background. So it gave us a nice little separation. This is one light. Now, when the booker originally looked at it, which is essentially her agent, said, I don't know, it may be a little dark. And we found out that a lot of people were doing the same technique. And what's nuts about it is it kind of tells a story. There's some meat feeling there. There's some emotion there. Um, I used it sparingly. I could have gone a lot more dark. A lot more images were much more dark. A lot more images were more well lit. But this is the one that made the cut because you feel some emotion there. It's over glamorized just a little bit. And this is why I say shadowing and contouring a wonderful ratio of lighting, use it to tell a story. No, that's just my two cents. But use it sparingly. You sometimes see very dark, dark images, and you feel like, I don't, God, I'm not feeling it. And that's what the one to four ratio lighting is. It's about more of a feeling, shadowing and contouring. Okay. And again, this was just shot with one light, not a big deal. One to eight ratio lighting. We're losing detail here. Another catalog shot. We're losing detail on this side. It's not great. This is almost, it's it's not quite true. This is more true up here. I want to say. Uh, make a long story short is this is really about the emotion, the mood behind the shot again. And again, dramatic low-key lighting has a lack of detail. And you get some hot spots here. And you get some very, very dark spots. Use it sparingly. OK, how you doing? OK, now as far as the light meter goes, what you're looking at is a typical setup of most light meters. Why should I buy a light meter? 
My camera has good histograms. I can always look at the image up and down. If I'm shooting tethered, I'm always looking at the images. A light meter is going to help you initially get into the ballpark of where, where you need to set your exposure. OK. We've, I said this way too many times, and I say it again. You're on, the, you're on the west side highway. You're going about 65. And you're going 65. And you're cruising. And you're cruising. You really don't know what 65 miles an hour is until you look at your speedometer. Same thing with light. You have a sense of the light. I have a feeling what's on me right now is about 4.0 at uh, 1 over, at 400 ASA, at 1 over 60-ish. I'm guessing. I have an idea. Am I close? I don't know. Not till I re actually measure it. Same thing with strobe photography. The same thing with lighting everywhere. Your camera is pretty good at, t at taking a meter reading. However, the camera is taking the whole frame into, the ac into account, and it's also getting an average of the 18% grays out of there. No right, no wrong. Pick the tools that's going to work for you. But if you're using strobe photography, You've got to use a light meter. You need a flash ambient meter. Otherwise, you're going to be guessing at your histograms. You're going to be guessing at your exposures. I'm going to show you today, within three to five frames, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm going to get, nail the right exposure with a light meter. I'm going to set up the light over here somewhere. We're going to pop it once. I'm going to do some adjustments, pop it again. I'll probably have it in about three frames, the correct exposure with a light meter. Another good thing about a light meter is this monster is about 15 years old. It has outlasted all my camera and computers to this day. And it's still doing its job. We shot with the 1DX last week sometime, which is that new uh, Canon camera that's coming out. And what the rep said is, this is kind of a unicorn, which I thought was very funny, because it exists, but it's not supposed to be here. We shot it. We shot with that camera. And the first thing we did is take a meter reading. Boink. And often, your tool in hand isn't going to match your camera. You know, you might be off a third stop or whatnot. What was kind of cool is we popped the flash, we went to the camera, set the camera for what the light meter said. We were only off two-thirds of a stop. Oh, no, two-tenths of a stop. That's it. That's pretty good. We're talking about a camera that hasn't even been born yet, essentially, to this old guy who's got, you know, kids running around. OK? Questions? Very good. Well, a uh, camera is it sends the refracted light. That is your That's correct. That's a very light. good point. That's a good point. The gentleman is, is saying that the camera is measuring reflective light as opposed to a, me a light meter, which is uh, <coughs> indicating the incidental light, and in other words, the light that's falling on you. That's a good point. That's why this makes this more, more accurate even more so, because you're on the same plane as your subject. You're not taking the whole frame into the account. You're taking right here. And I'm going to give you a light meter quiz later as well. All right. Now, every light meter has kind of the same nomenclature. Some are a little bit different. You'll see that mine's a little bit different than this one. But the nomenclature is basically the same, about 90%. They all have an ISO here. OK, you can adjust that. They all have your shutter speed. That's adjustable, too, when you're doing ambient. And here's your aperture. That says to me 16 and 3 tenths, OK? 16 and 3 tenths is actually f16, let's face it. If you're shooting for NASA, this is 16 and 3 tenths. OK? If it's that important, then it's 16 and 3 tenths. Now, let's take a look here. What are we looking at? Aperture, shutter, and ISO. The big three, guys, OK? Another reason why light meters are very important, OK? The big threes are all right here. They're going to help you zone into your exposure that you're wanting, that you've been dreaming about, that you're passionate about, the one that's going to make you money, all right? OK. This particular image makes me chuckle for a couple reasons. One reason is she's doing everything wrong, OK? Ensure that the globe is directed at the light source, OK? We don't know where the light source is, and she's just holding it up very randomly, OK? This is what she's doing, you know? And this is our light source here. And it's like, no. Beyond that, make sure the meter is on the same plane as your subject. That's not the same plane as your subject. It might be the meter should be on her face. Joey gets metered, I'm metering it right here, guys. Okay? If Joey's getting a photograph and my light source is up there, boink, this is what we're doing. Okay? Same plane as my subject and aiming at the light source. All right? Okay. The eye? Oh, if you want to meter by the eye, you can do that. Whatever your poison. There's no right or wrong here. Um, I'd like, again, if you want to meter this way, you know, that's fine. I tend to put it on the chin, that's just me. You know, no right, no wrong, as long as it's on the same.
plane as your subject and direct it at the light source. This does not count, all right? That's not gonna work, that's sloppy. When I saw the image, I just chuckled and I said, I gotta use it. Okay, we, candle, we covered the first two. Now when you're working with mul multiple lights, which we're gonna do here as well today, make sure you pick one as your main light source. What I mean by that, pick one as your key light. You have to make sure that you meter off of one primary light source and that's gonna be the f-stop that you put into your camera. Okay, we have a fine example of that coming. You, uh, I just said that. And remember, remember, first and foremost, a light meter is nothing but a tool. A camera is nothing but a tool. A computer is nothing but a tool. They're not going to make you famous. They're not going to make you more popular. They're not going to make you more handsome or prettier. They're just going to help you get the job done a little more efficiently. They're just tools. Don't get too attached to it. I'll be very honest, and I'm the first one to admit it. I'm a big gearhead um, to the point where I was, you know, like everybody, you know, you were buying this, you were buying that. Quite honestly, about five years ago, I stopped buying cameras because I finally kicked myself of the habit. For one reason, they keep changing every six months. I'm not buying into it anymore. I do have a computer, which I'm stuck with, I have to do, and I have very good lighting, and I have a great light meter. I'm done. These are the two tools of the trade for me, and they work. Um, entirely up to you. You can pick your poison. But remember, we're just, we need tools to essentially accomplish what we're trying to achieve here. Okay, and unfortunately, tech, we're bound by technology now. So buy sparingly, but buy wisely, okay? Do your homework. Ooh, okay. Give me one second. I'm gonna set up my strobe unit, and we're gonna do a light meter quiz. Essentially what I'm gonna do is we're gonna put the light meter on my good friend here, and it's in the flash mode. I'm putting it at one over five hundredths of a second. Essentially what this is gonna do is this is gonna eliminate any ambient or stray light to affect our overall meter reading, okay? Rule of thumb, make sure you know where you're at. If you're in the studio, pump it up to one over 500. If you're outdoors, pump it up to one over 500 just so you're influenced by your strobe unit, okay? If you want to incorporate your ambient within the shot, that's a whole other sequence of events there, okay? We have the little cursor arrow, electric arrow that's blinking. Nine out of 10 light meters have the same type of nomenclature. It's blinking, it means that it's ready to receive the flash, okay? Why don't you give us a meter reading? First thing he does correct is he's putting it on the same plane as, this, as our subject, right? And he's aiming it at the light source. I would prefer if that were tilted just a little higher towards the light source. That's better, and against the face a little bit. See what he's doing there? That's perfectly aimed at him. You know when the light hits him, it's gonna be pretty, pretty right on. Let's take a pop. Now give me a meter reading. Don't forget the bar graph on the bottom as well. F11. Mm-hmm. F11. F11 at. Point seven. Uh, oh no, or point seven, which is. It's almost. Uh, no, no, no. Well, okay, you're right, but it's eleven. It's it's F11 and what? Seven. And I said seven. seven. You said it. <laughs> seven tenths. That's correct. Now let's let's look at this. I'm going to give you another shot too here in a second. It's F11 and 7 tenths. What does that tell you? What is that really? It's F11, but it's 7 tenths. It's closer to 16, guys. Right? It's closer to 16. Okay? Now, let's do this. I move that up, what, 6 inches? 6 inches moved. Pop the little button on the side again so you get the cursor flashing. That's fine, yeah. Is the little cursor flashing? No. No, no, press the button on the side. Here we go. It's flashing. I moved the stand up about six inches. We're at 11 and 7 tenths on our last meter reading. Let's take another meter reading. What are you getting? F16. Okay, there's something I want to underline here beyond the, ex the exposure. Notice I just moved the light six inches. What we just practiced was a small, small sliver of the inverse square law, and that's gonna come later, okay? Look how easily we were able to adjust our f-stop. Joey likes to shoot at f11 and f16, preferably, okay? I just moved it six inches and I got my f-stop that I was wanting to get. In this case, let's say it was 16, all right? Let's do one more. Okay. I'm not quite convinced that you're ready for that reflector. <laughs> I don't know. It's a big responsibility, guys. I don't know, okay. Give me a second, press the button again. 
That was the that was the unit dumping. What you're witnessing is the unit just dumping some of the the uh, jewels that are there. Okay, let's do it. What are you getting? Eleven. And it's seven tenths. It's seven tenths on the dot. All I did was I moved down the light source just about a third or whatnot, and we're good. Do you think he deserves a light me uh, reflector? Yeah, he, did. Hey, he did fine. He did fine. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate your involvement. I kind of want to show you this because the next image is going to reinforce this even more so. This is basically the color wheel. Remember the color wheel. We all had one as a kid. And at this point, it's still a part of our lives. The only reason why I want, to re I want to throw this at you, because if you're having difficulty in your color balance, revert back to the color wheel, OK? You know that green, that puke green that we often get when we're shooting under fluorescent? That's easily cured with a magenta filter. You mix these two colors together, they're going to cancel out the mixed green. You're, shooting, you're getting orange or yellow in your images. How do you cure that? With a blue filter. Very common. Look at our little kitty cat here. Look at this tungsten shot. Looks like he's been sailing all day on the wild sea and he's just not feeling good. Make a long story short, how do you cure that? He's getting the blue, we're going to add orange, right? Or reddish orange, yeah. It's all very subjective at that point. Okay, so I just want you to remember this. The color wheel is still a part of your lives, okay? It's going to help you get more accurate, more, more images, more accurately color balanced, okay, in the long run. Especially if you're doing still life, you're shooting for clients, you're shooting clothing and whatnot, and more importantly, probably for skin tones if you're going to first notice it, okay? Now this next image here, there's my guy. <laughs> this essentially was shot for a designer downtown, some, I want to say last summer, at the end of summer. And I got a great story that goes with it, but make a long story short is Hector here works for Color Data, Data Color, sorry. And essentially what he does, he's a digital tech and he is also a representative for these people. What they essentially what they do is I take a shot of this, he goes into Lightroom or any of those uh, software programs, gets an eyedropper and corrects my color that way, okay? Very easily done. I don't do that quite honestly. He is a digital tech, he does it. When I do, do, do a shoot, I primarily do light and focus and that's it. Don't ask me to put the hair and makeup on the model. Don't ask me to fix your car. Don't ask me to take your kids to the soccer practice. I do light and focus, okay? So this is why I leave digital retouching, digital calibration. I leave it up to guys like my friend Hector here who knows this really well. And again, this is one of many tools that will help you get better color ultimately, okay? And if you really look at this carefully, this is nothing but a scattered, a scatterbrained uh, color wheel, you know, exaggerated, if you will. Okay. I wanted to get into shot discussion here, and basically what I want to kind of want to share with you is how every image here was shot, okay? And there's no rocket science here, and if you were in my class on Tuesday, bear with me. Um, essentially what we did here, this is a large softbox right here, okay? This is the sun, and we have a background. So we have three different light sources that we're dealing with here, okay? This was shot in the sticks of Pennsylvania some time ago. Make a long story short is the first thing I did is I had to meter the light that I cannot control. The light that I cannot control in this case is the ambient light. So the first thing I had to do is I had to go take a hike way in the back in the woods, okay? Somewhere out here, took a meter reading. And all I'm doing is I'm holding my meter up towards the sun and getting a feeling of what my ambient meter reading is. With that information, that information is going to dictate what I have to set my exposure at on my camera. In addition to that, I have to make sure that the softbox that's right here, that I put out enough power to meet the ambient light that I can't control. Okay? So that's essentially what we did. Went out, got an F16, and let's say 1 over 60, I can't quite remember, and I know I bounce around. And then I sh made sure that this light here, which is an artificial light, was also at F F16, okay? Now my shutter speed is at 1 over 60-ish, okay? How do I control this little hot spot that's on here? I control it through my, my shutter speed. And I'm also controlling the ambient light through my shutter speed, okay? So again, one light source way in the background, F11 at 1 over 60. Softbox, we metered at F11, okay? Now this is controlled by our shutter speed. Now how do I gauge that? I shoot it right, right what my meter tells me to do, and then what I do is I increase and decrease my shutter to get different hot, to make this either hot or dim. 
So I have some shots where you don't even see the sun because it's just, we're just clipping it essentially. And then I have other shots where it's way blown out. So I bracket like four to five frames just to get a feeling of how hot this should be. And this is a nice little separation. And what we're getting here is if you notice real carefully, that's like a nice little two to one ratio. That's twice the light as our primary exposure. The task here is making sure that our two dimensional plane looks three dimensional. And the way we're doing that is by creating a nice little rim light. Okay? And that's controlled by your shutter speed. Try it outdoors next time, guys. Get your subject in back, face in, with their back to the sun and just play with your shutter speed and watch the sun disappear. And you'll also watch the highlights go. It's a great practice to get an idea of how I control, how I can control the light that I ultimately can't control. That's what this is, really. Okay. So really the background is your key light? The background is my key light. No, in this case, no. My background is my fill light. Is my fill light. The, the softbox, you stand correct, the softbox is my key light. That's my main light source. And the only reason why I say it's my key light because it's, it's essentially lighting up my subject at hand. Yeah, you know, but you said something very good last class. <laughs> is I, my job at here was to make sure that my ambient light, the light I can't control, and my artificial light were the same output. And I, I can't forget that, and I, I thank you for saying that, because it's a very, it's a layman's way of explaining this. And then all I did was play with my shutter speed. Done. Question about the shutter speed. The shutter speed question. Yep. Sure you can. You can't, you, um, the shutter speed, um, the question is, is you cannot go faster than a certain amount on your shutter speed. You, you can go faster, but you can't go slower. You are correct, but it, it is the opposite. It's the inverse. Most digital SLRs have a maximum of a 1 over 250-ish. The Hasselblad has 1 over 500. Now, if you're shooting dedicated with like a speed light or whatnot, it's unlimited at that point, for the most part. Now, that's the goal. You know, I'm shooting at 1 over 60, and then I shot at 1 over 80, and I shot at 1 over 200, and then when I shot at 1 over 250, and I realized, I'm sorry? No, I'm shooting this with the pro photos. It's, it's, a, it's an artificial light, no speed lights here. In fact, I've used a speed light once in my life, only once, and it was here at b and I'm behind the counter. Yeah, I know. This is shot with a pro photo 7B DC pack, which is nothing more than a 1200 watt second uh, power pack source. Very much like these, they're all manual in every regard. You know, um, essentially just like driving a stick. You know, you, you can pop the clutch, you can have good days and bad days, and you can ruin it at the same time. <laughs> yeah. No, but essentially, I'm bound by the light I can't control. So I have to keep my parameters in mind in this case. What I mean by that is, I had to make sure that this ambient light, I had to stay within my parameters of, let's say, woo, 1 over 80 and 1 over 250. Because at anything below 1 over 80, at that point, people start looking blurry. For the most part, you know, it's, it's hard. But 1 over 80 is pretty good for something like this. Clear? There's no diffusion here. This is all shot with raw light. Bare bulb strobes, nothing fancy. Now, this is the way we did it. I'm on the ground like every shot that I do. I'm laying down this way, and I'm shooting it this way. Now, you can carefully see here. I don't know if you can kind of see. See that small little shadow on her hand right here? That's where the light source is coming from, the artificial light. This light that's lighting up her cab here is the sun. Again, what did I do? I went out, metered the light that I couldn't control, a little artificial light coming this way, played with the shutter speed, we're done. Okay? You got this now. Now this other one, this was a monster, and Joey always forgets his tripod, and I hate myself for it, but I always do it. I always shoot freehand, and the only reason why I don't use a tripod most of the time, because look where I'm at again on the ground. I'm laying on the ground again. For some reason, I'm always going for these shots that are low to high. Um, this particular shot was shot in a place in New Jersey, and it was really cool because they wanted the fireplace in the shot. Now you all know if anybody has shot fire, what is it required to get a good blistering fire out of it? You gotta drag the shutter you have to use a longer shutter speed. Longer shutter speeds and people don't mix at all, okay? So what we had to do here, I'm gonna be very honest with you, after sweating about a half a gallon when they told me they wanted this shot because I didn't have my tripod, I went to the restroom, cleaned myself up, and we got a huge umbrella right here, okay? The light is coming down. Notice the shadow on her other side of her face here, okay? It's coming down. 
I'm laying on a pillow and I have my camera on a pillow and I'm holding my breath, click, half second. Ugh. Click, one second. Okay, click, half second, one second, and then I went to a second and a third, a second and a half, and then from there on up to two seconds. And somewhere in that bracket I got the shot. Unfortunately, I had to overshoot just a little bit because some portions she was moving, it wasn't right, the flames were way over here at one point, you know, and it's hard to get fire to cooperate, you know. But that's nothing more than what it takes to get a shot like that. Very easy. And that was shot like something like at F8, again, at, at like one second. Joey holding his breath and sweating. So don't make excuses, just get the shot, all right? Ooh, what is the big three? And describe each for a reflector, silver and white 32 inch reflector. Come up here, buddy. <coughs> big threes. Uh, the aperture controls the amount of light. Yep. Shutter controls the duration of light. Ooh. Ooh. And the ISO is the graininess. That's right. Or, or the. Sensitivity. sensitivity. It's the sensitivity of your digital capture in this case. Well done, sir. Thank you. I like that. Give him a hand. It takes a lot of guts to... Very good, sir. And he's absolutely right. Essentially, aperture, shutter, and ISO. Aperture is the amount of light. The shutter is how long, the duration. And more importantly, the ISO, how sensitive we're getting. I tend to shoot everything at, one, at ISO 100, except for this class and a couple other classes because we're limited with space and whatnot. Then we'll, we'll jump to like 400 or whatever. Uh, why 100 for me? Because again, a lot of my work gets turned over to retouchers that I don't know and they just want everything tack sharp, they want it perfect, and they don't want any excuses. Okay? Simple as that. Oh, we're almost there. Inverse square law. Essentially, I kind of showed you a little bit of inverse square law, but since I come from a very, very pre prestigious scientific background, I kind of have to cover this, but without my nose in the air. Because I practiced this, and when I was asked to write this program, they're like, you kind of should cover this. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know if I practice it, but in reality I do, and you examine this by me moving the light stand a few inches up and a few inches back. Okay, let's look at this. The power of the light will be inversely proportional to the square of the distance. So that is, if we take two, we square it, we get four. The inverse of that is one over four. Easy, right? Not a half, but one over four. This is how I want you guys to start looking at it, and this is the way I've been practicing the inverse square law without actually knowing it. Okay? Basically, again, let's look at the top chart. It's, you're losing a quarter of your light. A quarter of the light is 25%. Got that, right? This is how we're going to start thinking from now on. We're going to start thinking in f-stops, okay? That if you move your light away, you're now losing f-stops because this is how it's going to interpret to your cameras, okay? I do want to underline that at the end of this program, I do have my email address, and I will be more than happy to send you the PDF version of this, okay? So if you feel like you need to capture it, that's up to you, but I will happily send it to you, okay? So knowing fall off, that's what this is really about. You want more light, get closer to your light source. You want less light, get away, and you will inversely change your f-stop. That's how you need to start thinking of fall off and the inverse square law, okay? Studio tools and umbrellas. Okay, let's go through this quickly because we really want to jump into our demo. Okay, here we go. Basically, this is a generic setup. If you ever get lost, which I'm sure all of us have done, and I've done this a million times, especially in photo school, where you set something up and you want to get a, you want to use all your equipment, you set everything up, you got your light set up, and you realize, God, this image is horrible. I hate it. So if you get stuck, and I've learned this from a lot of different photographers throughout the past, and I learned it from Henry Hornstein, who I had the pleasure of meeting very recently. Henry Hornstein is the master of academic photography. He wrote the book, the black and white, basic black and white book that, he used in, that is used in every college and university wet darkroom class to this day. In addition to that, he just published the digital photography book, Henry Hornstein. Know it, love it, you'll appreciate it, trust me. 45 degree angle from my subject. Here's the camera angle, and I'm using a reflector at 45 degree-ish. If you get lost, this is a good place to start. Or if you're just starting a portrait session, start at this point, okay? Good place to start. Kind of want to show you this little video, and this is Joey in the studio, I want to say this last summer. And you can see I'm using one light source. Look at that window in back of me. So you already know what I'm doing. I'm on the ground again, of course. I have my guy Kelly here throwing a little reflector fill. And I'm using nothing more than an umbrella here, one light. 
Actually, there's two lights because of the outdoors. Okay? And I want you guys to bear with me for one more second here, and I'll show you the results. Nothing fancy. And there's Joey being silly again. Okay? And she's doing different things. This is an agency girl. And again, she's just playing around. And I'll get to the end of it now. Okay? And that's the final results. Again, all I did, see, it was a muddy sky, so I had my retoucher add these little blues to it or whatever. But it works. And this is, I guaranteed, a good, nice, sharp background. Imagine the f stop I was shooting at. Look at everything's tacked sharp in the background. Easy. This is two lights. One of them's the umbrella, and the other one's the outdoor sun coming in. And it wasn't even a hard sun. You saw how gray it was. Questions? Yes, sir. Meeting for the sky originally. That's correct. That's exactly just like what we did before. I'm, I stuck my hand out the window and just got a feel for the ambient light. And then I, that's what I set the camera at. And that's what I set the, my umbrella light that was hitting them. It's still 1-1. One, one. It's still 1-1, one, one. no. And then I decreased my shutter speed by slightly so my background could be just a little bit hotter. So this one you went, you bounced on the umbrella instead of going through. That's correct in this particular case, yeah. Because I had to be extremely efficient because I'm dealing with this outdoor light as opposed to indoor. At this one, I actually increased the shutter speed, right? Because it's a little bit darker than my primary subject. Right? OK. You're getting it. Another umbrella. This monster is made by one of our competitors, and I love it. And we are soon going to be producing one, I hope. Um, it's a seven-foot umbrella. Man, look how soft and light it gets. OK, we're light using one light here, with the exception I have two kickers here. It's a beauty shot we did for Rachel some time ago. And See this little light in the corner here? Right there, it's kicking in and filling in for the background. If you notice, I have no other lights on the background. There's just that huge silver umbrella. OK? And the results come up real quick here. Now, do you, is that light really efficient? Do you lose a lot of shots? You actually are gaining a lot of light from that, absolutely, because it's a large silver umbrella. There's no light being kicked back from it. And, all, and it's silver, so it's throwing light everywhere. So if it were white, would and it would not be the same. And look how nicely lit up our background. We have the kickers coming in from the side. We're done. Now what I did, how did we get this? The first thing I did is Joey likes a what? F11 or F16. OK. Shot at F11 or F16, one of the two. I just had to make sure that my kickers that were sitting on the side metered one stop greater or twice the light. And those are the shots. OK, we turned off the kickers here because we felt the hair was just enough, you know, it had enough punch. Typical softbox setup, nothing fancy. Again, how many degrees from our subject? 45. OK, 45-ish here. And this is something that I want to put. Since we are homo sapiens and we all stand upright, most of us, the sun, we are used to seeing the sun come down on our subject matter. OK? The sun comes up, we're used to seeing light coming down on our subjects. I always stress about 20 degrees above the eye whenever you start doing a portrait session just so you have a little bit of believability what's inherent to nature, OK? 45 degrees, 20 degrees above the eye, 45 degrees-ish on the reflector. And again, since we're all different people with different sizes and different shapes, each one of these is going to require just a little bit of tweaking, OK? My backyard, old cruddy old sofa that I threw back there, let it rot for two years, became a great prop. One soft box, and I kind of show you what I'm doing here. And I do a little 360, and you'll see the model pose for a second. And there's my buddy Steve back there. Hi, Steve. And then soft box, there's the setup. Okay, there's the shot. Okay, nothing fancy. Basically, what did I do? I went to the background, found out what my ambient light was. I set the soft box for the same ambient light. Now, this one's a little different for one reason. Because this is dappling of the light. I wanted to make sure I got the brightest part of the light, the brightest, brightest part of the dappling that was out there. And that's what I set the softbox for. Okay? With that, and then I started decreasing the shutter speed a little bit. So I'd get a little more highlight dappling. Okay? Super easy. Well, you saw the setup. It's just a one light setup with an old couch and a girl. Okay? Who wants to come up here and answer this one? Describe, oh, wow. All it is, it's basically the same thing. Did you get a reflector last time? I think you did. Yeah, yeah, that disqualified. Uh, who wants to come up? 
Who wants to take a stab? You want to come up? Come up here, bud. Please. I don't know. You can do it. You can do it. Take a stab. Take a stab. Are they from what? I'm going to give you a scenario. You and I are walking on the West Side Highway. Joey, look at Hoboken. Look at the lights are twinkling. And I was like, wow, that's a great shot. I think you should get the shot. The, the key is you want to make sure that you get that cityscape of Hoboken with all those lights twinkling and the rippling of the water and that little reflection off the water. That's the goal, OK? You put your meter out there, your handheld meter, and you realize you're shooting at 5.6 at, uh, we'll say, 1 over 60. Tell me how you're going to get that shot. That's 1 over 60 now. How are you going to get that shot with twinkling lights in the background? You've seen the shots. Um, I would change my shutter speed. Yes, to what? We're you said 1 over 60? 1 over 60. I'd say like 1 over 30. Perfect. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you oh. <laughs> I'll see you after class. I'll see you in the principal's oh, office. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll share it with you. You did fine. You did fine, kid. <laughs> yeah, right? Was it you? So essentially, it's metering and setting the shutter speed for the existing light. Remember, this is what I say. When you drag the shutter and using ambient light, you have to meter for the light that you cannot control. And usually, it's the light that Mother Nature is giving you. OK? Simple as that. Beauty dish, nothing fancy. Basically, a beauty dish is nothing but an inverted uh, tr uh, trash lid. But it is, gives you a very large surface area. This is one that we are designing now, and it's a prototype. We've been working very hard on it for the last couple years. And um, large surface area, like a, tra like a trash lid, but more importantly, very little diffusion, so it tends to be a little more contrasty. It's very efficient in its light throw. Beyond that, there's no light loss in the back. Throws light in one direction, boom. Contrasty, efficient, tends to be a little harder and a little more specular. When you add a honeycomb grid, on the other hand, if you look through here, that gives us directional quality. And that's how you gain control off of strobes, for the most part. You know, that's how you do it. A lot of people like the beauty dish because it's a good alternative to a softbox for one reason. It tends to be a little more contrasty, a little more portable. You just mount it to the reflector, you're done. Okay. This is a salon shoot we did in November. I can't remember. It was November, October. And um, I'm sorry about this stuff in the beginning. My buddy, he was editing and he was like, oh, they want to see everything. No, they don't. OK, reflector fill on the side. Nothing fancy. This light right here, I use it as a focusing light most of the time when I'm shooting because there's nothing more frustrating when you're shooting the camera goes, you just want to grab it and throw it. Essentially, you saw the beauty dish up there, right? Did you guys see it? Yeah. OK, I'm going to back up just to be safe. OK, just so you can see it, because it's this easy. The tool is literally about 30 degrees, 30 degrees above my head and about three feet in front of me. And that's my only light source. That's it. Kelly again, focusing light again. Here you go. One light, and you'll see it up here. It's my boy Hector. He's holding the fan. Make sure that's the beauty dish that we're using. It's just one light hitting the model. Boing, boing, that's it. Do you ever use your uh, beauty dish like you would use a, uh, like a diffuser to the left or to the right? Do I ever use a beauty dish the same way, like, uh, like an umbrella or something like of that umbrella source, umbrella moving it to the left, to the right? Absolutely. There's no right, no wrong here. And the only reason why we did this is because this was for a hair salon. They wanted stuff that was a little more directional. And again, you know, and this is what we got. It's, it's kind of an in-your-face kind of shot, OK? It's clean, it's pretty, it's an easy kill, in other words. Okay, and it all depended on subject matter. Of course, I'm only light and focus. You know, there's hair and makeup and a good girl behind it. So, I mean, I can't take all the credit by any means. Okay. Best advice given to me was master your ratios, guys. Master, master your ratios. Think in f-stops. Very, 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 very important. Know your equipment. Understand that they're not going to make you rich and famous. They're not going to get you more. They're not going to make you more popular. But beyond that, dis in addition to that, you're going to discover your own process in making your own art. What got me into photography? Again, it was my aunt looking down into that rolly and understanding of like, wow, it seemed like such a technical, uh, creative process for her to take images. And she would think about it every time she took a shot. And that's what I'm here to do. I want you to start thinking about your photography for two reasons. Digital is, is kind of making us a little lazy in many regards. When I shot film, Every touch of the trigger was money. Now we tend to do this. 
I want you guys to start thinking of your shots. To give yourself a time limit, tell yourself, I'm going to get this shot in two frames, and I'm going to think about this shot before I start taking it. That's what this class is really about, because in turn, you're going to discover what it takes to get your own art done, your own process, OK? My name is Joey. If you have any questions, comments, whatever, I will send you this PDF. More, I'll be more than happy to send you this PDF. Beyond that, if you have any questions about any lighting equipment, you want me to critique some of your images, if you want to ever help out on a photo shoot, let me know. I'll put your name on the list. And now, for the demonstration portion, let's head over to the B&H Studios, where we have a little more control over the light. Thanks so much for joining us here in the studio, guys. Essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to do several different setups. Uh, we're going to start off with a continuous light. Uh, we're going to start off with a continuous light with a rim light. We're going to add a little reflector fill. And um, in addition to that, we're going to do strobes, strobes with a white translucent umbrella, a strobes with a silver umbrella, and of course, strobes with the softbox, and then of course, the beauty dish, something that I've been talking about, something that we've been designing wholeheartedly for the last year or so. And I think you'll really like the results from that. Um, so let's just get started. Essentially, what we have here is we have the Octabank 6 and 9 here. Uh, essentially, it's a daylight balance light source. It gives uh, a very cool light. And what I like about it, the interior is silver beaded, and it allows a nice diffusion right when the light hits the uh, interior. Uh, beyond that, what you see is what you get. And you can kind of see right off Christina right now is, as she looks straight ahead here. You can see how the light's carving against her right now. So what we're going to do is we're just going to take a clear shot, nothing fancy. We're not going to add any reflector fill at this point, and just to see what we get out of the box. Okay, let's take a look here. Alrighty. Okay, very good, Christina. Right at the lens. Lift the chin just a millimeter. Perfect. Right over here a little bit more. Beautiful. That's it. Okay. And see what this looks like. Alrighty. Very good. As you guys can see there, if we add a little reflector fill, I think that'll add in quite nicely. Okay, let's get my assistant up here. Can I get Harold up here to give us a hand with the reflector? There you are. Great. Here we go, Harold. Now, I'll, if you want to grab that over there, I'd really appreciate it. And we're using an oversized silver reflector today. One reason that I, saw, I was telling earlier is that the larger the surface area, the softer the light. So the same thing applies with reflectors. If we use a nice large reflector, essentially it's going to give us a nice surface area. Now, Harold, if you can, kind of just jimmy that up into here like that right there. And you can see how quickly that makes such a difference. Let's drop that. See how different that is? Look how quick the difference is. Quite drastic. Let's take a few shots, and you'll see the difference as they come up here. All right. OK, here, let's get that reflector in there. Very good. And as you can see, I'm always handling the reflector and trying to get a feel where the sweet spot is. Look right at me, Christina. Raise the chin up a little bit. Take the chin. Very good. That's it. OK, and I'm filling it in. And you can see it's filling in the nice cheekbones underneath the chin a little bit. Very good. OK, and again, what we're doing is we're shooting manual in RAW. And I'm going to use the internal light meter in this case. All righty. We'll do a couple of these shots. Very nice, Christina. Beautiful. One more. Excellent. OK. Very good. As you can see, the images look awesome. Now let's do something a little bit different. We're going to add a little, ref little fill, or as a hair light, as I say. Something that I never practiced, but something that kind of needs to be done in this case for a little separation. And in this case, we're going to call it an edge light. And if you step away and you take a look at our subject matter, you can see the nice little rim light. I'm going to turn off our primary light source, and you can see the rim light as it's doing its job there. And I tend to do this quite a bit in the sense that I get an idea of how much I need or how much I need to take off. And what I'm doing now here in this case is I'm feathering the light a little bit. And I'm taking off a little bit more. See how nicely that accents her hair? Her nice, wonderful hair that I asked her to curl last night. I'm glad she did. OK, here we go. All right, and we add our main light source. And you can see how this completes the picture. Very good. Let's do one with a reflector and one without a reflector. Harold, let's get you in there, buddy. Thank you, sir. OK, and again, you kind of have to custom mold the reflector every time. And again, we're using a large reflector like this for one reason. We want a large surface area. It gives us a large sweet spot. Look how nice she shines there. OK, let's come in. Beautiful. All righty. Chin up a little bit, Christina. Beautiful. This way. Perfect. Hold it. Very nice. Very nice. One more. Excellent. 
Now let's do another one without the reflector, just so we can see the contrast between the two. As you can see with the reflector, with that rim light, these images are awesome. Very nice. Okay. Now this is without the reflector. We get a little more contouring on the cheekbones, which is kind of nice on her. She has such strong features. Raise the chin up a millimeter. This way just a drop. Perfect. Very good. And on these images, you'll see how nicely the cheekbones are defined. Excellent. Beautiful. Okay. So what we have here essentially is we have a continuous light by itself. We add a little reflector fill, a little silver reflector fill, larger surface area, softens the light, and then we added a rim light, or it's commonly known as a hair light, to get a little separation from the background. Now take a look at these images. You can see the one with the reflector, one without the reflector, one with the silver fill, or with the uh, rim light, and one without the rim light. Very nice. Very good. We did good there. Okay, let's take a few seconds here. What I'm going to do is we're going to start uh, working with the light meter and with the strobe unit, and we're going to start off with a white translucent umbrella. Okay, give me five seconds, guys. Okay, we're back here in the studio, and essentially what we've done, we set up our Impact 160 Monolite with a white translucent umbrella. Now, a 160 unit's not going to give you a, a whole heck of a lot of output, even that, you know, in, compared to like a 400 watt second unit. Now, keep in mind, you're not going to light the Taj Mahal with a light unit, but for something that we're doing here today, up to a three quarter, definitely give you a headshot or whatnot. Maybe even shoot a small group, maybe five or ten people if you do it right. Uh, but beyond that, um, not a bad unit. 160 watt seconds, that's what we're using today with the white translucent. Now let's first start off using our light meter. And again, the light meter is not going to make you a better photographer. It's not going to make you rich and famous, but it will get you within the ballpark when you start metering. And let's see how many frames we can get from zero to our final frame here with our light meter. Chris, you want to hand me the light meter? Thanks. Okay. So let's take a couple pops here. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check the back of the light here just to see where we're at. Okay, we're about three quarters down and I'm at 100 ISO. And the first thing I'm doing is I'm setting the light meter at 1 over 500. This will eliminate the light meter being influenced by the ambient light that's exis existing. And we do certainly don't want that as a part of our calculation when we take our final shot. Okay, so first thing we're doing here is we're depressing it. We're making sure now, everyone, that the globe is aimed at the light source and it's on the same plane as our model. Not over here like we saw on the other slides and whatnot, but more importantly on the same plane as our model. So I'm popping it here, and at the light, Chris, you want to give me a pop? Okay, and we're at F8. Now, F8 normally would be a very good exposure. We kind of want something like that, but I've been challenged by somebody here in the room that they want me to shoot at 6.3. So we're at F8 now. Not terrible. I would prefer this for a nice headshot, quite honestly. I think it would be, do a fine job, but um, let's practice the inverse square law a little bit. Now, we're at F8. Give me another pop, Chris, just so we're on the money here. Okay, it's F8. Inverse square law, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move back the light source just a little bit. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm depending on my fall off. And let's see if we can get our 6.3 here. Give me another pop. Okay, we're at 5, 6, and 8 tenths. And again, unless you're shooting for NASA, it really doesn't matter. So let's see how close our light meter is to our camera. Remember, each of them are going to have their own tolerances, but beyond that, this is just a tool to get you there. And once you understand how your tools work with one another, you'll understand the different deviation that you're going to need to uh, make between the two. Um, okay, let's take a few shots. Now we're going to set this camera at 6.3 at 1 over 125. 1 over 125 is usually quick enough to catch a blink, to catch somebody action moving, and like I said in the studio, we tend to shoot a lot of girls with their hair blowing and it catches that really tech sharp. 6.3 at a 1 over 125. Let's take a look here. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Take a couple shots. All righty. Same as before. Now, we're doing this without a reflector at first, and what we'll do is, same as we did with the continuous light, is we'll add a reflector fill, and we'll go from there, and we'll just essentially build the shot. And I think what we're going to do is add a grid to the back as well once we get there. Okay. Let me chin up just a millimeter. Perfect. Beautiful. Very good. Okay, let me shoot another one here. Very good. Okay, give me one second here. These images are going to come up. Very good. You can see we're pretty darn close on this exposure. Um, if I had a choice, we'd drop it down just a millimeter or two. And am I being picky? Yes. Am I out of my mind? Yes. But let's, let's, let's overanalyze this just a little bit. Now, I'm just going to pull the light out just a little bit more. And the only reason being is because I think we're just getting a little more specularity than we wanted. Okay. 
What I tend to do is I tend to look at the subject matter. Yeah, it's just a little hot for me. I, again, I'm bouncing back, looking at my subject matter. Take a look at me, Christina. Square on. Okay. I'm going to drop the light just a little bit. You heard that. That was just one little bounce. I moved it back a couple inches. Let's take another shot here. Okay. Here we go. Very good. Chin up a millimeter. Beautiful. Hold it. We'll do two of these. Excellent. Okay, let's wait for that to come up. Now the biggest question is sometimes is like, you know, how do I do I keep my client waiting when I'm re-metering and re-metering and re-metering? What you essentially what you want to do for yourself, especially if you know you're gonna be doing a headshot or if you're doing a catalog shoot or whatnot, we always have a stand-in that comes in. We try to get a preliminary meter reading right as we're starting to set up, just so we get in the ballpark. Because the last thing you want to do is waste a model's time, waste a client's time, and trying to re-meter the light, readjust the lights and whatnot. At this point, at least we can say, okay, we can take three or four frames, get our shot right, and then we can start analyzing for what it is. And these are the last shots. I think we're on the money. Looks really, really good. Excellent. Okay, I'm very happy with these. Now let's do a few of these just for Christina so she can have something nice for herself, okay? Very good. And what we're going to do is we're going to take two of these and then we're going to add the reflector film to the next two, okay? It's four total. Very good. Okay. Right here, turn the shoulders towards me. Beautiful. That's it. Very nice. Okay. Chin up a little. Perfect. Excellent. I'm going to come out just a little bit wider on this next shot. Let's do one more. Very good. Gorgeous. Let's add a reflector fill. Very good. Here we go, Chris. Okay, essentially what we're doing here is we can't really see how the light's going to fall on our subject, and we have ambient room light in here. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to use our reflective savvy here. So we know that the light's going to be bouncing off the umbrella and onto our subject. So kind of think of it this way. If this thing were a shower head, the light's going to be falling everywhere. It's going to fall, splash here, and run into our model. And that's kind of what we have to depend on when we're shooting strobes. You kind of have to use your savvy, and more importantly, you got to have to know your equipment. All right? So we'll take a couple shots here. And you'll see what I'm talking about as far as the nice, large, large surface area of using a reflector there. Okay. There we go. Let's switch up the, the pose just a little bit. That's it. Very good. Good. Ah, oh, that's it. Chin up. Beautiful. Stiff arm. I like that. Chin up a little bit more. Perfect. Beautiful. Okay. We'll do three of these just so we get it. Excellent. Okay. We can pull out the reflector. Now take a look at these shots. Wow. We really did good. You can see the reflector filled in the shadow drastically. The exposure is right on the money. It added a little life to it. And beyond that, um, I think by changing the pose a little bit was kind of key to it as well. So if you're getting stuck in the studio, you're not sure what you're doing, um, kind of change it up. Have her move a little bit or have your subject maybe move their arms, switch their weight uh, to and fro. That's always helpful. Now, how many frames did it take to get this shot, Chris? Four. Four frames it took to get this shot, essentially. Did the light meter help? You better believe it. Could we have done it without the light meter? Probably so, using the histograms within the camera, possibly using Lightroom as, a, as a, essentially as a second source of seeing the images. But the light meter is going to help us minimize the backtracking and to and fro work, essentially, when you're trying to nail your exposure. Um, let's add a rim light at this point. So give us a few seconds here, guys. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, add a grid on a secondary light source. Okay, so give me a couple seconds. Okay, now that we're back in the studio, what we're going to do is we set up our, we have our Impact BSD 160 monolight with a white translucent umbrella. And what we're doing is we're setting up a grid light in the back. And essentially what this is, as you can see through here, it's nothing more than giving the light directional quality. We add this honeycomb grid to the back and it's going to add a nice little rim light or edge light to the model. And this is a very effective way in strobe photography to get that edge light. Now, we also have to meter this light as well. So we're going to put it back here. We get a feeling for where it's falling on the model. And what we'll do is we'll first turn off our main light. And that's easily done. And we're going to meter this. Okay, Chris, why don't you give me a pop? Okay, we're getting an F4 out of it. So just for exper experimental uh, purposes, we're, let's take a shot of Christina here with just the rim light, just so you can get an idea of how the light's going to fall on her and to see whether or not that's going to give a nice, nice separation. Take a shot here. 
and we're using the very same exposures, okay? So here we go, we're at 6.3, and again, our meter on our rim light is at f4, so that's like a stop or so under, but again, it's a raw light, and we're depending on the specularity off the hair. Very good, chin up a millimeter, perfect. Let's do two of these. Very good, okay. Now, as you can see, the rim light is adding a very nice separation to this part of her hair. And it's just subtle enough, and more importantly, it's just elegant enough to give her that punch, or more importantly, give her that 3D effect. And remember, as photographers, we work in a two-dimensional plane. It's our job to make it three-dimensional. And this is what this rim light's gonna do. Let's add our main light source. Okay, there we go. And again, we've changed nothing. Exposure is exactly the same. Now, just because Joey's paranoid, Let's take another meter reading. And as you can see, I'm already flagging this light off, so this light isn't going to affect the exposure of this light. So let's do that. Give me a pop, Chris. Okay. One more time. Sorry, sir, I wasn't quite ready. And again, that's five, six, and a little over two thirds. All righty, let's take a look here. Okay, very good. Same as before. Excellent. Okay, come out just a little bit. Very good, chin up a millimeter, very good. Okay, let's do two, let's do one more just for sake. Oh, very nice. Okay, excellent. Wow, what do you guys think? Great shot, right? Clear separation between the subject and the background, and that rim light is, again, just elegant enough to give her a nice little separation on the hair. I love it. Um, I'm gonna do something just a little more drastic just to give it a little more glam, if you will. I'm going to pull the light just a little bit more in back of her and see if I can get a glow off the other, off the shoulder a little bit more. And I'm going to pump this light up maybe two beeps to see what we get out of it. And this is what I tend to do in the studio. I tend to experiment like that just so I can diversify my shots. And often, you know, they're happy accidents and more importantly, it's about understanding the process to make your own art. Okay, here we go. Excellent. Beautiful. Okay. Give me a second. Very good. Turn the shoulders just a little bit. Beautiful. A little bit more. Hold it. That's it. Okay, let's do, ooh, very good. Very nice. Excellent. Wow. Let's add a reflector fill. I love what we're getting. And when you guys see these images as they pop up, you're going to love them. Okay, and again, I'm just holding it in there like that. Very good. And again, it's hard to determine where the light's falling because we're using strobe lights. Okay, but again, use your savvy. Think of the light as water bouncing, okay? Very good. Very good, Christina, love it. Chin up just a millimeter, beautiful. Okay. Okay, look at these shots, guys. Take a look. Essentially, all we have here is one light source is our main light source, or, or a key light source, the white translucent shoot through. That's creating a light, nice large surface area, softens the light. We had a nice little rim light in the back with a nice little 20 degree spot grid on top. <laughs> nice separation on the hair. We added a silver reflector and look what we got. You'll love it. Simple two light setup with a reflector. Easy, easy, easy. Now beyond that, let's move on to a silver umbrella. And give me a couple seconds here guys, I'm gonna set that up there. Our first umbrella was the white translucent umbrella, which I explained earlier is an extremely inefficient light source. Essentially, the white translucent umbrella, its charm behind it is to throw the light everywhere. Extremely inefficient. Remember, the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, very inefficient light, but beautiful light. This monster, on the other hand, um, is a contradiction to that. It diffuses the light from the get-go, has a silver beaded interior, so it's not only very highly reflective, but beyond that, it tends to grab the light and diffuse it everywhere. A very soft light source, but a little more contrasty, a little more specular, essentially. Um, again, a lot more efficient, tends to be a little more contrasty. Let's take a few shots with this. Okay, guys, let me just set this up here. Alrighty. And the same rule of thumb, we're starting at 45 degrees from the camera and 20 degrees above the eye. And very simple. We should all know that by now. And I always check my light source just to make sure we're good. And again, the camera's there. Up 20 degrees, we're good. Okay, first thing we need to do is meter this. That's right, guys. Okay, perfect. Okay, let's turn this on. Very good. Okay, let's take a look here. Give me a pop, Chris. 
We're at five, six and a quarter, or a third. That's actually six, three. That's pretty darn good. Let's take a shot. Let's see how close or how far we off. I have a feeling we're going to be pretty close. What do you guys think? Okay. Nothing's changed, okay? The only thing that we've done is we've changed our lighting modifier from a white translucent to a silver beaded. Okay, and we're going to see how far we're off. And then you're going to notice a big difference as far as the specularity. One thing that we want to do, though, I forgot to take off. Let's eliminate the hair light in the background. Give me one second, guys. We will add this, but on another shot. All righty, here we go. All righty, right here, Christina. Very good. Chin up just a millimeter. Very good. Okay. Excellent. Okay. First thing you want to notice, it tends to be a, just a drop more contrast. And the way you're going to identify this, you're going to identify this by the shadow contouring. You can see the shadows are a little more sharp, harder cheekbone, nice if you want a little more strength in your images. Now what we want to do is we want to add a little reflector fill because Christina has a very nice jawline and that's something that we want to show off. Let's get you in there, Harold, thanks. Okay, now this is a one light setup, guys. Remember that. Just one light, and it's going to feel multidimensional. Excellent. There we go. Chin up just a little bit more, and I'm coming out just a little bit so we can distinguish the two shots. Very nice. Okay, we'll do one more. Excellent. Love it. To me, that's just a drop over expose. What do you guys think? Just a drop. So what we're going to do is we're just going to, we can do one of two things. We, can, we have three different variables. Remember, we have our aperture, we have our shutter speed, and our ISO. What do we want to change as far as the variables? Right. We definitely want to use the practice the inverse square law. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull back the light just a little bit. And if that's uh, too much or if you're limited by space, at that point you can actually divvy down the power on your light source. So again, what I'm doing right now is I'm checking to make sure that my light source is 20 degrees above the eye, 45 degrees angle. Now something that I've been stressing a lot is you want to make sure that the light is feathered from your subject. That is, you do not want the light hitting directly at your subject matter. The light is actually hitting here, and I'm going to be a little more daring, and I'm going to go a little more extreme on the angle. Now it's actually hitting here. But again, I'm depending on the inefficiency of the light source. The light that Christina's actually going to be receiving is right here or it's on the outer edge of the umbrella. That's the sweet light. Remember, beginning of the day and at the end of the day, most inefficient light. Let's take a look at what these look like. And we pulled our light, our light out just a couple inches. We moved our, our feathered our light out a little bit more. And let's add a little reflector fill, Harold. Very good. Thank you. Okay. That's it. Excellent. Okay, we'll do two, maybe three frames. Let's do three. Very good. Excellent. Okay. Love it. What do you guys think? A little more contrasty. The nice silver reflector added a nice little uh, punch to it, if you will. But more importantly, she's very dimensional. She feels very alive. And that's essentially what we want out of the shots. Um, again, only a one light source at this point. So at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to add another light source. And that is we're going to add a grid in the back. As opposed to using the 20 degree grid like we did in the last setup, we're going to spread the light out a little bit more with a 40 degree grid. As you can see, it's a much larger area. Let's change that grid out, guys. And because it's 40 degrees, again, it's going to have a larger spread of light, so we can be a little more generous with it. So I knock down the light just a little bit, and I'm going to pull back the stand just a little bit more. Again, I'm trying to get a little more light in this general area here. And you'll see how drastic it is. And the first thing we want to do, of course, is we want to meter that. Alrighty, and let's unplug our, our main light source is unplugged. We're good. Okay, here we go. Give me a pop there. And that's at four and a third. That's going to be a lot of light, I can tell you right now, because there's no modifiers or whatnot on there. And more importantly, we are really depending on a larger spread. Twice the spread as we had before, guys. Okay, so here we go. Let's take a shot. All I did was move the light back a little bit. I did not change my primary light's output. We're leaving that the same, and that's going to meter the same, essentially. Okay. Now, we're going to do this with and without a reflector. Let's start without a reflector this time, and then we'll see what it looks like with the reflector. Same as before, guys. Very good. Okay, here we go. Let's do one more. Very good. Love it. 
Now look how dr dramatic that light is on her. It's beautifully carving her out right here. I love the way it's hitting her hair right here. It's so nice. Now let's add a reflector fill, and I think you'll love the results. I'm happy with them now already, but let's add a reflector just so you can see the diversity here. Okay, very good. Excellent. Okay, same as before. Do three quick shots. Excellent. Beautiful. Look how nice that silver reflector filled in the, the nice jawbone, the cheekbones, the hair is beautifully accented. This is a successful shot, guys. I really love this. And I'm happy with the silver reflector. Before I was happy without, but I think I like it better with. Um, let's change over to a softbox and we'll get a feeling for that. Now we're going to change light modifiers, modifiers onto a softbox. You saw the white translucent umbrella, the silver beaded umbrella, and now a softbox. I'm sure you're all familiar with the softbox. Essentially what it is, it's a controlled window light. Um, nothing more than an internal translucent scrim which diffuses the light, and then a secondary diffusion panel which is the external diffusion which gives a even softer light. The light is encapsulated within the box, is thrown about, and thrown through the two diffusion panels. Quite nice. And again, it mimics nothing more than a window. Um, back in the day when the masters were painting by window light, uh, photographers thought the same thing. Let's create our portraits by a huge window light. All right, let's mount this to our light source and we can see what the results that we're going to get here. Okay, again, going back to my subject matter, making sure I'm 45 degrees from the camera and about 20 degrees above the, the subject. And simply what I'm doing at this point, I'm just making sure that the light corresponds to her. And again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to further the light away from the subject matter. Okay. The light is actually hitting here. Christina's right here. Okay. Again, one more time, I'm underlining it. We are depending on the inefficiency of the light source, the edge lighting of it. Okay, here we go. Give me one second. Okay, let's make sure the radio slave is on. All right, it looks like we're in shape here. Okay, Chris, why don't you give me a pop? Okay, at that point we're getting an F4. Now the first thing we're going to notice is our exposure has changed quite a bit. Why? Because the light box, these monsters suck up light. Remember, the light's being thrown in, there's no real directional quality within the box. It's being sucked up in there and then thrown out in one direction. So it tends to absorb a lot of light. And again, uh, when you get very soft light, you sacrifice light output. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the light in just a little bit because Joey's not crazy about an F4 for this kind of shot. And I'm going to pull it out just a little bit more there. Okay. And just because I want like a closer to an F8 or 6.3, I'm going to bump up the light source just a little bit. Okay, why don't you give me a pop there, Chris? Yeah, we're at four and three quarters, not quite enough. Pump it up just a little bit more. Alrighty. I think we'll be in good shape. Give me a pop. We're at five six and a third ish. So that's six three essentially. Let's take a shot here. Okay. Okay, same as before. Now, okay, right here. Very good. Do one more. Excellent. Very good, Christina. Very good. Beautiful light. Now, like the old masters, you can honestly see that nice little Rembrandt triangle that's created underneath that chin, uh, on the cheekbone there. Quite nice. That's essentially what the old masters did in painting. Rembrandt, Vermeer, that's what they're looking for. And that's essentially what us photographers depend on when we use a softbox. Let's add a reflector fill, guys, okay? Same thing as before. Now, no right, no wrong, no better, no worse as far as using a light source or a light modifier, but it's just really up to you. You just want to make sure that you practice the basics. Okay, here we go. Very good. Thank you. Excellent. Ooh, very good. We'll do one more. Nice. Love, love what we got. Okay, the reflector fill filled in the nice Rembrandt triangle. That's up to you. Very subjective. If you want a little more dramatic, take away the reflector. A little less dramatic, add the reflector. Or well, more of a glam look is essentially what the reflector is doing for us. I love it. Now, do we need to add a rim light? Entirely up to you. I'd rather not on this particular shot because I just love the way the coverage of the softbox is giving us right now. Um, quite nice. Now keep in mind, is there a better softbox than another one? What size should I be using? I tend to go with a 24 by 36 most of the time. 
Uh, they do make a 72 by 48, I believe, which is huge. Those are always nice to have in the studio. One reason being is because it's like having a huge skylight at your extra disposal, essentially. I love having one of those around. And also to have a very small softbox, because if you're doing a very confined headshot, something of that sort, you can get really nice directional quality, especially if you're shooting somebody with very hard features, maybe a boxer or somebody like that. Maybe you want to show off a little bit of drama. Now to the highlight here is we have our beauty dish. Uh, one of our talented designers has been working on this for about a year and a half or so, and uh, we've been essentially taking the lead of other uh, lighting manufacturers and, and trying to essentially create a light modifier that gives you a lot of surface area, a very soft light, a lot of contrast, and more importantly, easy to mount. Uh, this thing mounts in a flash, quite honestly. Beyond that, it comes with several different mounts that allows you to mount it onto any monolight or strobe light, whatever you have. Um, so we're accommodating in that regard. But let's take a look at it here. Large surface area, they either make them in silver and or white. This one's a particular white one. And if you notice here, and it's, I don't know if you can see it, but if you look very carefully, it does have a textured surface. That textured surface mix, uh, mimics and diffuses the light right from the get-go. Essentially, light hits it, it spreads out, and again, because of its surface area, it tends to be a little more soft. Um, this little cap here, essentially what this is doing is this is catching the light and throwing it back into the dish. Um, great little light source. Let's take a few shots and I think you'll be pleased with it. A little different quality here and I think you'll, you'll see real quick. Okay, here we go. Okay, and at this point all I'm doing here is I'm raising the light just a little bit because I kind of tend to treat the beauty dish like a shower head. Now, again, I said this before, if I were the Jolly Green Giant, this would be my shower head, and I would be underneath it, and it would just be splattering water everywhere. You kind of have to think along the same lines when you're working with a subject matter. Now, again, the light is aimed right here. Christina's right here. Again, I'm depending on the inefficiency of the light, and I'm just going to make it a little more drastic in that regard. And the light is over here now. Yeah, it's right here. And again, the very edge of the beauty dish is actually being used at this point. Okay, do some fine tuning. Let's do a meter reading just so we're safe. Okay. Okay, we made no adjustments to the light. All we did was change our light modifier. Okay, when you're ready, we're at F4, not enough light. Okay, let's add a little more light here. Give me a pop, Chris, just so we dump the, the monolights. Very good. Okay, here we go. Same as before, give me a pop. Now we're at 5.6. This is F4 and 9 tenths, which is 5.6. Again, unless you're shooting for NASA, F4 and 9 tenths is 5.6. Okay, let's take a couple shots. Now this is nothing more than just a beauty dish, a raw head, if you will, or a raw modifier. Okay. And let's change our aperture. Thanks. Okay. To 5.6. Very good. All righty. So just a minor adjustment. All right. Looks good. Let's do two more. Excellent. Chin up just a millimeter. That's it. Very nice. Excellent. Love it. And you can see, I think it's just a drop overexposed. What do you guys think? What I'm going to do at this point, as opposed to changing the light, so changing the output on the light, I'm just going to move it out just a little bit. Just a minor adjustment. And again, remember the beauty dish is nothing but a huge shower head. So there's going to ha it's going to have some, a hard spot and a soft spot, and the light quality is going to reflect that. Okay. And once you get to know your tools, you'll be able to make these adjustments. And a lot of this comes intuitive to me. I've been working with a lot of light modifiers throughout the years, so I, I already have a feeling of how the light's going to kind of look. Um, same way as driving. You can jump into any car, essentially, and jump in and know where the gas and, and brake is. Just about understanding the nuances of the vehicle. All righty. Here we go. Same as before. And all we did was move the, the light back just a little bit. And let's take a shot or two. Let's see where we're at. Very good. Okay. 
love it, love what we're getting. It's a little specular in this area, and that's only because of the beauty dish tends to be a little hot. Not a big deal, there's an easy remedy for that. Again, inverse square law, I'm just moving the light back, and I'm gonna prove it by taking two more shots. And again, back to kicking the stand, guys. And I'm telling you, when you learn how to kick your stands, you're gonna really get your lights down. Now, if you remember, this is only the second set that we're doing here. It's like five or six frames that we're taking. I'm gonna do two more, and I guarantee you we're gonna nail our exposure. Very good. Nice. Excellent. We got it. Okay? Easily done. Beauty dish. I want you to think shower head. The light is everywhere. Again, the light is aiming towards me, so I'm depending on the inefficiency of the light source. Christina's here, the light's here, okay? And all we did, all we simply did was move the stand back just a little bit, bring the light up just a little bit more to correspond for the distance, and we're done. How do we get there? With our light meter, exactly. Now, at this point, we did make a grid for this monster as well. Let's take a look at the grid here. Thank you. Now, this guy, as you can see here, it is essentially giving a huge amount of directional quality to the grid. What we're going to do is we're going to dip the lights down here and you're going to get to see how this monster is going to really define the shower head. It's the equivalent of getting a water hose and, and basically putting it in that hard stream mode. You can put it in the wide mode or you can put it in the hard stream mode. This is the hard stream mode. Okay, so let's take a look. Now, with the lights off, forgive me for turning off the lights here, I just, but I just really want to underline the directional quality that this grid is giving us. Um, it's going to take a few seconds here, but real quick, you can see real, identify it how much directional quality this grid is giving us. Okay, see how quick that is? And it really defines where the light source is going. And that's what we're depending on now. Okay, because working with strobe, the ambient light isn't gonna affect us. Okay, we can turn the lights back on. I think that's quite clear. Now that we got the lights back on, the first thing we need to do is re-meter the dish. Okay, here we go here. Now because it's got a grid on it, I guarantee you we're gonna lose some light. Just a little bit. All right, Chris, why don't you give me a pop when you're ready, sir? Very good. We're at five, six and a half ish. So, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pop this up just a little bit. And my goal is to get like a six three again. Okay, let's work with that. Give me a pop, Chris. Um, and again, if, unless you're shooting for NASA, don't overthink it. Very good. Same as before. Excellent. Very nice. Very good. Let's do two more. Chin up just a millimeter, Christina. Great. Excellent. Love it. See the dramatic quality that that grid added? It really defines her face, really pulls in the cheekbones. Love it. The jawline's gorgeous. Um, I want to thank you guys for coming out to the lecture today. I really appreciate your time and your effort. And more importantly, it was such a nice day today. And uh, it was a real pleasure for me to be out here. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, you want to, be more, and want to get a little more detailed about any of the light modifiers that we used today, Email, they'd be more than happy to get that info back to you. In addition to that, make sure you check out the Impact website because we've been working on a definition or a glossary of different uh, photo terms. And I've been working on this very hard for the last couple months. 10,000 plus terms on there, so feel free to check that out as well. Uh, again, contact me, questions, comments, and thank you guys so much for coming out. I really appreciate it. For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web.